Responses to the event. In one of the early novels about Hannibal Lecter, the claim that Hannibal's monstrosity is the result of unfortunate circumstances is rejected. Nothing happened to him. He happened. This is the most concise formula of the event in Bajur's sense, an emergence of the new which cannot be reduced to its causes or conditions. Or to quote the wise old saying with which one of the gothic DVD games starts, each event is preceded by prophecy, but without the hero there is no event. One can easily translate this obscure wisdom into Marxist terms. The general outlines of each revolutionary event can be foretold by social theorists. However, this event can only really take place if there is a revolutionary subject, or as Bajio might put it, only if there is a subject can an event occur within an eventual site, which is why, for Bajio, the different modes of subjectivity are simultaneously the modalities by which the subject relates to the event. Echoing Kant's thesis that the conditions of our experience of the object are simultaneously the conditions of the object itself, Bajio celebrates four such responses: the faithful subject, the reactive subject, the obscure subject, resurrection. Perhaps this list should be complicated a little bit so that there are actually six responses. The responses to the Freud event were: one, fidelity. Lacan, two reactive normalization, reintegration into the predominant field, ego psychology, dynamic psychotherapy, three outright denial, cognitivism, four obscurantist mystification in a pseudo event, Jung, five total enforcement, Reich, Freudo, Marxism, six. Resurrection of the message of the eternal Freud in various returns to Freud. The responses to a love event are one fidelity, two normalization, reintegration, marriage, three outright rejection of the eventual status, libertinage, the transformation of the event into sexual adventure, four thoroughgoing rejection of sexual love, abstinence, five. Obscurantist suicidal mortal passion, a la Tristan, six resurrected love, reencounter. The responses to the Marxism event are one fidelity, communism, Leninism, two reactive reintegration, social democracy, three outright denial of the eventual status, liberalism, Fure, four catastrophic total counterattack in the guise of a pseudo event, fascism. Five total enforcement of the event, which ends up in an obscure disaster, Stalinism, Khmer Rouge. Six renewal of Marxism, Lenin, Mao. So how do one and six coexist in figures such as Lenin or Lacan? This brings us to a further hypothesis: an event is necessarily missed the first time. So that true fidelity is only possible in the form of resurrection, as a defense against revisionism. Freud did not recognize the true dimension of his discovery. It was only Lacan's return to Freud that allowed us to discern the core of the Freudian discovery, or, as Stanley Cavell put it, apropos the Hollywood comedies of remarriage, the only true marriage is the second marriage to the same person. This point was recently reiterated by Jacqueline Miller. One might believe that there is no heresy without orthodoxy. But one often observes that it is when discourses, which will later be heretical, emerge, that the future orthodoxies come about, and that it is rather through an after-the-fact effect that orthodoxy takes hold. The point is not just that orthodoxy is the triumphant heresy, the one which succeeded in crushing all others, but a more complex one. When a new teaching, from Christianity to Marxism or psychoanalysis, emerges, there is first confusion. Blindness about the true scope of its own act. Heresies are the attempts to clarify this confusion by retranslating the new teaching into the old coordinates, and it is only against this background that the core of the new teaching can be formulated. It is against this background of multiple responses to an event that Adrian Johnston recently discerned the ideological critical potential of the Bajuian topic of eventual breaks. When the balance of an ideological situation is disturbed by the emergence of symptomal knots, elements which, while formerly part of the situation, do not fit into it, 
the ideological defense mechanism can adopt two main strategies, false eventalization of the dynamics which remains thoroughly integrated into the existing situation, or disavowal of the signs which delineate true eventual possibilities. Their reading is minor accidents or external disturbances. 1. Making mere modifications appear to promise eventual newness, a tactic that comes to the fore in the ideology of late capitalism, whose noisily marketed perpetual revolution is really just an instance of the cliché the more things change, the more they stay the same. Or, as Badger puts it, capitalism itself is the obsession of novelty and the perpetual renovation of forms. 2. Making the sites of sheltering potential explosive eventual upheavals appear to be, at minimum, unremarkable features of the banal everyday landscape, and, at most, nothing more than temporary, correctable glitches in the functioning of the established system. Perhaps this line of thought needs just one qualification. Johnston writes that The ideology of the worldly state, through a sort of bluff or masquerade, disguises its non-integrated weakest points, its Achilles heels, as fully integrated cogs and components of its allegedly harmonious functioning, rather than as loci containing the potential to throw monkey wrenches in its gears and thereby generate eventual dysfunctions of this regime, a regime that is never so deeply entrenched as it would like to appear to be in the eyes of its subjects. Is it not rather that one of the ideological strategies is to fully admit the threatening character of a dysfunction, and to treat it as an external intrusion, not as the necessary result of the system in a dynamic? The model is here, of course, the fascist notion of social antagonisms as the result of a foreign intruder, Jews, disturbing the organic totality of the social edifice. Recall, then, the difference between the standard capitalist and the Marxist notion of economic crisis. For the standard capitalist view, crises are temporary correctable glitches in the functioning of the system, while from the Marxist perspective, they are its moment of truth, the exception which only allows us to grasp the functioning of the system, in the same way that, for Freud, dreams and symptoms are not secondary malfunctionings of our psychic apparatus, but moments through which one can discern the repressed basic functioning of the psychic apparatus. No wonder that Johnson uses here the Deleuzean term minimal difference. A minimal, minuscule difference, here construed as the difference between the change category statuses simultaneously assigned to a single intra-situational multiple both by the ideology of the state and in opposition by another non-statist framework. When we pass from the notion of crisis as occasional contingent malfunctioning of the system to the notion of crisis as the symptomal point at which the truth of the system becomes visible, we are talking about one and the same actual event. The difference is purely virtual. It does not concern any of its actual properties, but only the way this event is supplemented by the virtual tapestry of its ideological and notional background. Like Schumann's melody for piano first played with and then without the third line of notes written only for the eyes. Johnson is right here in critically noting, Badieu's quick dismissal of apparently gradualist measures of seemingly minor political adjustments and reforms i.e. not quite eventual gestures, in the sphere of legislation and socio-economics, while awaiting the quasi-divine intervention of the system-shattering eventual rupture, ushering in an uncompromisingly perfect revolution. But the preceding analyses call into question whether he can be entirely confident and sure that what appears to be gradual or minor really is so, or, rather, simply seems this way solely under the shadow of statist ideology's assignation of change category statuses. One cannot ever be sure in advance if what appears within the register in the space of visibility of the ruling ideology as minor measures will not set in motion a process that will lead to the radical, eventual, transformation of the whole field. There are situations in which a minimal measure of social reform can have much stronger large-scale consequences than self-professed radical changes, and this inherent incalculability to the factors involved in setting the pace of the cadence of socio-political change points towards the dimension of what Badieu tried to capture under the title of the materialist notion of grace. Johnston raises the following question. What if the pre-evental actors don't really know exactly what they're doing or quite where they're going? 
What if, under the influence of statist ideology, they anticipate that a particular gesture will effectuate a system-preserving modification, only to find out, after the fact of this gesture, that their intervention unexpectedly hastened, rather than delayed, the demise of this very system? Is not the first association that comes to mind here that of Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika, which, while aiming at minor improvements that would make the system more efficient, triggered the process of its total disintegration? These, then, are the two extremes between which political interventions have to find their way. The skila of minor reforms, which eventually lead to total collapse. Recall also the fear, justified, we can say today, of Mao Zedong that even a minimal compromise of the market economy would open up the path that ends in total surrender to capitalism, and the charybdis of radical changes, which in the long run merely fortify the system. Roosevelt's New Deal, and so forth. Among other things, this also opens up the question of how radical different forms of resistance are. What may appear as a radical critical stance, or a subversive activity, can in fact function as the system's inherent transgression, so that often a minor legal reform which merely aims at bringing the system in accordance with its professed ideological goals can be more subversive than open questioning of the system's basic presuppositions. These considerations enable us to define the art of a politics of minimal differences, to be able to identify and then focus on a minimal, ideological, legislative, and so on, measure which, prima facie, not only does not question the system's premises, but even seems to merely apply its own principles to its actual functioning, and thus render it more consistent with itself. However, a critical ideological parallax view leads us to surmise that this minimal measure while in no way disturbing the system's explicit mode of functioning, effectively moves underground, introduces a crack in its foundations. Today, more than ever, we effectively need what Johnston calls a pre-evental discipline of time. This other sort of temporal discipline would be neither the undisciplined impatience of hurriedly doing anything and everything to enact some ill-defined, poorly conceived notion of making things different, nor the quietest patience of either resigning oneself to the current state of affairs, drifting along interminably, and or awaiting the unpredictable arrival of a not-to-be-actively-precipitated X sparking genuine change. Badger's philosophy sometimes seems to be in danger of licensing a version of this latter mode of quietism. Those subjected to today's frenetic socio-economic forms of late capitalism are constantly at risk of succumbing to various forms of what one could refer to loosely as attention deficit disorder, that is, a frantic, thoughtless jumping from present to ever new present. At the political level, such capitalist impatience must be countered with the discipline of what could be designated as a specifically communist patience, designated thus in line with Badger's assertion that all authentic forms of politics are communist in the broad sense of being both emancipatory as well as generic, qua radically egalitarian and non-identitarian. Not the quietest patience condemned above, but instead the calm contemplation of the details of situations, states, and worlds, with an eye to the discerning of ideologically veiled weak points in the structural architecture of the state system. Given the theoretical validity of assuming that these camouflaged Achilles heels, as hidden eventual sites, can and do exist in one's worldly context, one should be patiently hopeful that one's apparently minor gestures carried out under the guidance of a pre-evental surveillance of the situation in search of its concealed kernels of real transformation, might come to entail major repercussions for the state of the situation and or transcendental regime of the world. There is, however, a limit to this strategy. If followed thoroughly, it ends up in a kind of active quietism, while forever postponing the big act, all one does is to engage in small interventions with the secret hope that somehow, inexplicably, by means of a magic leap from quantity to quality, they will lead to global radical change. This strategy has to be supplemented by the readiness and ability to discern the moment when the possibility of the big change is approaching, and at that point, to quickly alter the strategy, take the risk, and engage in total struggle. In other words, one should not forget that, in politics, major repercussions do not come by themselves, 
True, one has to lay the groundwork for them by means of patient work, but one should also know to seize the moment when it arrives. The specifically communist form of patience is not just patient waiting for the moment when radical change will explode in a manner reminiscent of what systems theory calls an emergent property. It is also the patience of losing the battles in order to win the final fight. Recall again Mao's slogan, from defeat to defeat to the final victory. Or to put it in more Bajuian terms, the fact that the eventual eruption functions as a break in time, introducing a totally different order of temporality, the temporality of the work of love, fidelity to the event, means that, from the perspective of non-eventual time of historical evolution, there is never a right moment for the revolutionary event. The situation is never mature enough for a revolutionary act. The act is always, by definition, premature. Recall what truly deserves the title of the repetition of the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, led by Toussaint Louverture, it was clearly ahead of its time, premature, and as such doomed to fail. Yet, precisely as such, it was perhaps even more of an event than the French Revolution itself. These past defeats accumulate the utopian energy which will explode in the final battle. Maturation is not waiting for objective circumstances to reach maturity, but the accumulation of defeats. Progressive liberals today often complain that they would like to join a revolution, a more radical emancipatory political movement, but no matter how desperately they search for it, they just do not see it. They do not see anywhere in the social space a political agent with the will and strength to seriously engage in such activity. While there is a moment of truth here, one should nonetheless also add that the very attitude of these liberals is in itself part of the problem, if one just waits to see a revolutionary movement, it will, of course, never arise, and one will never see it. What Hegel says about the curtain that separates appearances from true reality, behind the veil of appearance there is nothing, only what the subject who is searching has put there, holds also for a revolutionary process. Seeing and desire are here inextricably linked. In other words, revolutionary potential is not there to be discovered, as an objective social fact. One sees it only insofar as one desires it, engages oneself in the movement. No wonder the Mensheviks and those who opposed Lenin's call for a revolutionary takeover in the summer of 1917 did not see the conditions for it as ripe and opposed it as premature. They simply did not want the revolution. Another version of this skeptical argument about seeing is that liberals claim that capitalism is today so global and all-encompassing that they cannot see any serious alternative to it, that they cannot imagine a feasible outside to it. The reply to this is that, insofar as this is true, they do not see to gut. The task is not to see the outside, but to see in the first place, to grasp the nature of contemporary capitalism. The Marxist wager is that when we see this, we see enough, including how to go beyond it. So our reply to the worried progressive liberals, eager to join the revolution, and just not seeing it having a chance anywhere, should be like the answer to the proverbial ecologist worried about the prospect of catastrophe. Do not worry, the catastrophe will arrive. To complicate the image further, we often have an event which succeeds through the self-erasure of its eventual dimension, as was the case with the Jacobins in the French Revolution. Once their necessary job was done, they were not only overthrown and liquidated, they were even retroactively deprived of their eventual status, reduced to a historical accident, to a freakish abomination, to an avoidable excess of historical development. This theme was often evoked by Marx and Engels. How, once normal, pragmatic, utilitarian, bourgeois, daily life was consolidated, its own violent, heroic origins were disavowed. This possibility, not only the obvious possibility of an eventual sequence reaching its end, but a much more unsettling possibility of an event disavowing itself, erasing its own traces, as the ultimate indication of its triumph, is not taken into account by Badiou. 
the possibility and ramifications of there being radical breaks and discontinuities that might, in part due to their own reverberations unfolding off into the future, become invisible to those living in realities founded on such eclipsed points of origin. Such a self-erasure of the event opens up the space for what, in the Benjaminian mode, one is tempted to call the leftist politics of melancholy. In a first approach, this term cannot but appear as an oxymoron. Is not a revolutionary orientation towards the future the very opposite of melancholic attachment to the past? What if, however, the future one should be faithful to is the future of the past itself? In other words, the emancipatory potential that was not realized due to the failure of the past attempts, and that for this reason continues to haunt us. In his ironic comments on the French Revolution, Marx opposes the revolutionary enthusiasm to the sobering effect of the morning after. The actual result of the sublime revolutionary explosion, of the event of freedom, equality, and brotherhood, is the miserable, utilitarian, egotistic universe of market calculation. And, incidentally, is not this gap even wider in the case of the October Revolution? However, one should not simplify Marx. His point is not the rather commonsensical insight into how the vulgar reality of commerce is the truth of the theatre of revolutionary enthusiasm. What it all really came down to. In the revolutionary explosion as an event, another utopian dimension shines through, the dimension of universal emancipation, which, precisely, is the excess betrayed by the market reality which takes over the day after. As such, this excess is not simply abolished, dismissed as irrelevant, but, as it were, transposed into a virtual state, continuing to haunt the emancipatory imaginary like a dream waiting to be realized. The excess of revolutionary enthusiasm over its own actual social base or substance is thus literally that of the future of, in, the past, a spectral event waiting for its proper embodiment. Most of the romantic liberal enthusiasts who first welcomed the French Revolution were appalled by the terror, the monstrosity unleashed by the revolution, and started to doubt its very rationale. The notable exception here is Shelley, who remained faithful to the revolution to the end, without idealizing it, without brushing terror under the carpet. In his poem, The Revolt of Islam, he formulated a rejection of the reactionary claim that the tragic and violent outcome was in some way the truth of the bright revolutionary hopes and ideals of universal freedom. For Shelley, history is a series of possible outcomes. Possibility has priority over actuality. There is a surplus in it beyond its actualization, the spark that persists underground, so that the very immediate failure of emancipatory attempts signals to those who harbour future revolutionary aspirations that they should be repeated more radically, more comprehensively. Perhaps the reason Badieu neglects this dimension is his all-too-crude opposition between repetition and the cut of the event, his dismissal of repetition as an obstacle to the rise of the new, ultimately as the death drive itself, the morbid attachment to some obscure jouissance which entraps the subject in the self-destructive vicious circle. In this sense, life, as the subjective category of fidelity to an event, keeps at a distance the conservation drive, the misnamed life instinct, as well as the mortifying drive, the death instinct. Life is what breaks with the drives. What Bajo misses here is the fact that the death drive is, paradoxically, the Freudian name for its very opposite, for the way immortality appears within psychoanalysis, for an uncanny excess of life, for an undead urge which persists beyond the biological cycle of life and death, of generation and corruption. As such, the death drive stands for the very antipode of the obscure tendency to self-annihilation or self-destruction as is rendered clearly in the work of Wagner, whom Badiou admires so much. It is precisely the reference to Wagner which enables us to see how the Freudian death drive has nothing whatsoever to do with the craving for self-extermination, for a return to the inorganic absence of any life tension. The death drive does not reside in Wagner's hero's longing to die, to find peace in death. It is, on the contrary, the very obverse of dying, 
a name for the undead eternal life itself, for the horrible fate of being caught in the endless repetitive cycle of wandering around in guilt and pain. The final passing away of the Wagnerian hero, the death of the Dutchman, Wotan, Tristan, Amphotas, is therefore the moment of their liberation from the clutches of the death drive. Tristan, in Act 3, is not desperate because of his fear of dying. What makes him desperate is that, without Isolde, he cannot die and is condemned to eternal longing. He anxiously awaits her arrival so as to be able to die. The prospect he dreads is not that of dying without Isolde, the standard complaint of a lover, but rather that of endless life without her. The ultimate lesson of psychoanalysis is that human life is never just life. Humans are not simply alive. They are possessed by the strange drive to enjoy life to excess, passionately attached to a surplus which sticks out and derails the ordinary run of things. This excess inscribes itself into the human body in the guise of a wound which makes the subject undead, depriving him of the capacity to die. Apart from Tristan's and Amfortas's wound, there is, of course, the wound, the one from Kafka's A Country Doctor. When this wound is healed, the hero can die in peace. This notion of the drive embodied in an organ also allows us to propose a correction to Badger's notion of the body of a truth procedure. There are no bodies of truth. Truth has its organs without bodies. In other words, a truth inscribes itself into a body through its autonomized organs. The child's wound in the lower chest in Kafka's Country Doctor is such an organ, part of the body yet sticking out of it, leading an immortal, undead life of its own, secreting blood all the time yet, for that very reason, preventing the child from finding peace in death. It is at this point that one should turn to Deleuze against Badiou, to Deleuze's precise elaborations on repetition as the very form of the emergence of the new. Of course, Badiou is too refined a thinker not to perceive the eventual dimension of repetition. When, in Logique des Mondes, he deploys the three subjective destinations of an event, faithful, reactive, obscure, he adds a fourth, that of resurrection, the subjective reactivation of an event whose traces were obliterated repressed into the historico-ideological unconscious. Every faithful subject can thus reincorporate into its eventual present a truth fragment which, in the old present, was pushed beneath the bar of occultation. This reincorporation is what we call resurrection. His beautifully developed example is that of Spartacus, erased from official history. His name was resurrected first by the Black Slaves' Rebellion in Haiti, the progressive governor, Lavco, called Toussaint Louverture Black Spartacus, and a century later, by the two German Spartacists, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Leibknecht. What matters here, however, is that Badger shirks from calling this resurrection repetition. <laughs>